So, we needed to measure orgasm in the laboratory. And not many labs had tried to do this before. And the reason we needed to is we wanted to understand something about depression. People who have problems with depression don't tend, seem to have problems experiencing pleasure initially, but they have problems sustaining that pleasure over time. So, uh, one of the ways that this manifests is when they have something pleasurable that happens to them, a part of the brain becomes active called the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, and that activity is associated with a dampening of the joy. So there it goes. Our question was, is that dampening, that loss of sustained pleasure over time, is that due to people who struggle with depression not having the skill that is maybe something we could teach them to do? Or maybe they have the skill, but they have trouble engaging it. If it's the latter case, then there's one way you can document that. You can give them something that's very pleasurable, that's very low effort, very low threshold, and see if they're able to sustain pleasure in that case. Other laboratories have studied this using an amphetamine challenge. That is, actually giving people amphetamine in the laboratory. It carries some health risks, but more importantly, it doesn't give you a sense of how the person naturally responds. It's a drug model. So we wanted to use orgasm to actually test this more directly in a natural way. Now, I am a licensed psychologist, but for most of the last decade, I've been a sexual psychophysiologist. What that means is psycho, the psychology, and then the physiology is all these sensors that we attach to people. And we use these to try and understand the connection between the brain, the body, and then people's perception of what's going on with them. So this question is exactly the type of clinical issue that I'm interested in and something that we can answer with these types of tools. But if you think climate scientists have trouble, hang on. <laughs> I got a story to tell you. So I started at UCLA in about 2012 as a faculty member in the Department of Psychiatry, and it was like a candy store. I was surrounded by some of the most brilliant people on the planet. And I was working my butt off, you know, trying to get the publications, chase the grants, uh, you know, do the talks, all these things. I got promoted to associate scientist, so I'm thinking I'm doing the right thing. And then two things happened. In 2013, we published what was still, what is still the largest neuroscience study of the porn addiction model. Unfortunately for us, the data indicated that it wasn't consistent with an addiction. Uh, at least no substance or behavioral addiction that we know of. So we falsified the porn addiction model. There were some people who were unhappy with our data, <laughs> put this mildly. Uh, so uh, amongst those that were unhappy, some of them were therapists who had been treating sex and porn addiction for many years, uh, who now built into their training for their therapists how to debunk our research to their patients so that they can continue, uh-huh so that they could continue charging patients to treat this non-diagnosis with untested treatments. Uh, also, the LDS, who you may be familiar with, the Mormon Church has a long history of trying to discourage masturbation, and it's fallen out of favor <laughs> for a while. So uh, they recently have switched strategies to demonize porn instead and taken on a health uh, verbiage around this to say now it's not masturbation they're worried about, it's pornography and it's addictive. So in response, you know, I got called a child molester and an antichrist, you know, maybe these are kind of expected. But then a few weeks ago, I uh, even had the senator from Utah, Todd Weiler, publicly saying that I was funded by pornography organizations and that I was outspoken because, you know, female scientists, we should really shut up. So uh, then, of course, there are the trolls. And you shouldn't pay attention to trolls. You should pay them no mind until they write UCLA over a dozen times claiming that you faked your data, that you faked your title, that you're involved in a mass conspiracy to promote pornography. And the lawyers have to respond to all this garbage. <laughs> so that was going on. They were dealing with it. Uh, in the midst of this, I had a bunch of personal photos stolen and posted on some of their websites which they then linked to the location of my laboratory. So we notified the police, we notified our staff, we shut the lab, moved the signs, and closed things for a while. 
Now, my name is still on this one person's website, stalker over 1,500 times, and you may have some experience with this, but as a scientist, I had never had this happen before. <laughs> I did not know how to respond or how to deal with it, frankly, and it's scary. So you may at this point have the legitimate question, are you actually promoting pornography? What is the story behind this? So I have a secret to tell you. If you look at the data, people who view more erotica actually ha are more egalitarian, they're more educated, they report higher sexual drive for their current sexual partner. For women, it's actually a great benefit. They are more likely to engage in behaviors that will result in higher sexual functioning, including greater orgasm consistency and greater desire for their partner as well. But you've probably never heard any of this. Why is that? Well, certainly the media love a good porn panic. I mean, it's a very sexy story, very easy to sell. But I think there's another issue too. That is, scientists, you know, we have our biases as well. And if you look at all of these studies reporting negative effects, oh, it's associated with divorce, it's associated with poor relationship satisfaction, they're making kind of a funny error in their analyses in relating porn viewing and these negative outcomes. You do know what people are doing when they watch porn, right? <laughs> right? So they're not saying, Mom, the movie's about to start. You know, I'm like, come on, get the popcorn. <laughs> No, of course not, right? They, they're spanking the monkey, they're beating the meat, they're rubbing the raisin, they're, I feel like I haven't gotten yours yet. <laughs> He's, ah, there we got one. Having a date with Pamela Henderson, a date with Miss Michigan, let's get the righties and the lefties in there. Uh, you know, they're jacking off, they're jilling off, they're jerking off, uh, we would say digital stimulation. They're masturbating, right? This is primarily what pornography is used for. And yet, none of these studies control for this one-to-one -one covariate, meaning that they're making a misattribution, most likely. That is, you're angry with your partner, you're no longer turned on by your partner, you masturbate. And sometimes, you happen to be looking at porn when you do that. It's a very different picture, and somewhere that our science needs to advance. So the second thing that happened is this orgasm study. <laughs> so, to understand how something might be not working well, you need to study people in which it is working well. We need to do a study of orgasm in regular folks. To do that study, we need money. To get money, you need to apply for grants. To apply for grants, you need pilot data. So, we applied to our ethics board to have this study reviewed, and the ethics board said no. They didn't cite any privacy or safety concerns. They said, you have to remove the orgasm component or we won't approve the study. We said, that's the point of the study. <laughs> We're not gonna remove that component. And they said, well, then you are now the second study in the history of UCLA to be rejected. So after this, we had to pivot. <laughs> We sought a private foundation funding, and we were successful in getting a grant to study orgasm with them. And then we removed the orgasm component and sent the application back to the National Institutes of Health, and we got that funded. And I thought, thank God, <laughs> because I'm getting near the end of my contract, which on soft money, you need to uh, transition to fund yourself through grants, and had been successful. So I said, okay, what's the account number? Where should they send the checks? They, they have the checks written. And UCLA said, we won't be taking your money. It's the only time I've ever heard a university turn down grant funds because they didn't want the work done there. So at this point, <laughs> I'm getting near the end of my contract and you know, single, no kids, in Los Angeles, and all I had ever wanted to be was a scientist. And I wasn't sure what to do. So I do a fair amount of statistics as well, hit some R, a little SQL. So I grabbed a job as a data scientist at a little startup in Santa Monica, and I thought about next moves. And I watched this startup and kind of how they were handling themselves financially and advertising. And I went to some meetups about startups, looked at some patents, talked to a business attorney. And at the end of about a year of doing some data science work, I said, you know what? Fuck this. I want to be a scientist, and I'm doing it on my own terms. So I incorporated Libros 
which is now an independent research institute that's in Hollywood. We took the grants into the company successfully. I'm doing exactly the work they told me not to do in exactly the way it should be done. And it feels amazing. So we are now using uh, Libros to do a few things. I'm gonna indulge, ask you to indulge me for a little bit here. You may know from Alfred Kinsey, this approach, you should never ask someone if they masturbate, you should ask them how often they masturbate, right? Let's assume. So if you would raise an appendage for me, whatever you got in the air, give me one. We're all gonna start in, buy in. I will wait. Put your hands up. I will run down this clock. Come on. Now. <laughs> so I would like you to leave your hand up and leave your hand up if you have ever used masturbation to help you fall asleep at night. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, you can put your hands down, you perverts. So, <laughs> clearly, a number of people are using this as a strategy. The funny thing is, I used to work in behavioral medicine, and I helped people who had sleep disorders, sleep problems, work on sleep hygiene, and there were all these treatment manuals for it. But you know what wasn't mentioned in any of them? Not for assessment, not for treatment, was anything about orgasm, timing sex, using masturbation to aid sleep, how that should be used. That's crazy. <laughs> like, here's something that so much of the population has found to be helpful in you know, helping them fall asleep at night, at least by reports at PopTech and the bar. <laughs> Where is this represented? So the main thrust of the company has been trying to find ways to use sexual stimulation to promote general health. And here's a few of the ways that we started doing that. So the earlier Marvin Gaye quote from his sexual healing, these are options that people may find are endogenous, so unlike the amphetamine, they're more safe, they could be affordable, maybe we can find ways of replacing medications with these approaches. And accessible, <laughs> so accessible. So uh, we're doing a study of orgasmic meditation. We have people that come into our lab, they stimulate each other's genitals, and we monitor their brain response while they do this. It's the first study I'm aware of since Masters and Johnson that's done this in the US, and we're looking for its effects on uh, depression and anxiety symptoms. We're also doing a series of brain stimulation studies. This shows transcranial magnetic stimulation being done on the motor cortex, which is why your hands are jerking, not painful. This is important because in people as they're recovering from depression, one of the first domains of pleasure that returns is usually in the sexual domain. So if we can do something to enhance that, that could be of great help to people who have affective disorders. And you know, we finally did that orgasm study but we ran into a bump. It turns out, many of the women we tested in our study, when they said, I'm having an orgasm, this is them hitting a button. They had to hit a button. <laughs> I'm having an orgasm. And we looked at the trace from their body, they weren't actually having an orgasm. Crap. <laughs> so the guys always did, but we didn't know this was a phenomenon in the women. So now we need to backtrack a little bit and try and understand that physiology a little bit better. Well, I'm trying to learn <laughs> how to build some of these uh, anal probes. Yes, that's the best place to pick up the contractions. It's not been going super great, <laughs> but I'm trying. So there's always the commercial over-the-counter option. I'm sure Amazon has many questions for me. <laughs> We still represent this as, of course, what we meant to do in the first place, <laughs> as it's represented here on this uh, show. So now that we have this company, I'm able to take huge risks, work fast, and we can get from the laboratory to society much more quickly with our media partners. We've always said sex sells, but you can't buy it here. With Libros, I'm working to change that by identifying sexual stimulation that may improve general health parameters, and I look forward to testing you soon. 